All right. Today's video here is about, it's actually a response to Justin Peter and Jim Osmond. Saw a video of theirs, it's fairly recent. And it asks the question of whether God is speaking to Muslims around the world through dreams. And of course their position was that God does not speak through dreams to Muslims around the world. And I noticed it seemed like a lot of the video to me seemed like a big straw man argument that either God saves people through the gospel or he saves them through dreams. Well, I never heard anybody say God is saving people through dreams without their ever hearing, ever hearing, knowing or understanding the gospel. I, that doesn't really make sense to me. Now, in their video, they showed some clips from a CBN News, uh, CBN News clips where they're talking about uh, Jesus appearing to Muslims in dreams or Muslims having uh, dreams about Jesus before becoming Christians or, or becoming Christians through dreams. Um, they showed a clip where a man said that Jesus touched him on the forehead and told him he was redeemed. And that was the little clip they showed. Well, I believe it was uh, Mr. Osmond who made the uh, comment and he was saying that uh, there was no indication there that the man understood that he uh, needed to repent of his sins, to uh, believe in Jesus, that Jesus died for the cross for, for, on the cross for his sins, or rose from the dead, or whatever uh, you know aspects of a biblical doctrine that he talked about. And I was thinking there's no indication there that the man did not know all those things before he had the dream of Jesus touching him on the forehead. Now, if I, if I were to talk to a Muslim, I believe God speaks through dreams, but I were to talk to someone from a Muslim background, and that was his testimony that Jesus, he had a dream, Jesus touched him on the head and said he was saved, and so he was saved. Well, I might ask him, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for, for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again from the dead? And if he said no, then, you know, I, I wouldn't have to have a specific opinion about the dream. I might suggest maybe it's going to be fulfilled in the future. You need to believe the gospel, and then I could share the gospel with him. So, uh, the, you know, I, it's, we, people don't get saved apart from the gospel. That's just not the way. Okay, that's just not the way it works. Oh wow, I'm getting some important people calling me right now. Um, so anyway, the uh, it's the um, the Bible does the Bible now. What they argued in this video, what they kept saying in the video, was that the idea that God speaks through dreams is antithetical to the Bible. That it's against the Bible. And I heard their argument for it, and honestly, their arguments to me seem extremely ridiculous. And if you actually read the Bible and study the Bible on the topic. It does teach that God speaks through dreams. So they're arguing that the Bible says the opposite of what it teaches. And I'll, I'll go with their apologetic first with what they say. I'm going to show where the Bible actually teaches that God does speak to men through dreams. Um, and we'll have to, uh, you know, first of all, we'll, well, I'll start with uh, the scripture that they use to say that God does not, or one of the individuals used to argue that God does not speak through dreams. And I want to do a bit of screen sharing here if I can figure it out in this uh oh boy share there it is okay click this share button and I'm going to share with you some scriptures from the Bible and I got some other notes here too are we seeing that okay there it is I think that's highlighted there okay so we're gonna look here at Hebrews they read from Hebrews and I'm doing the ESV here I can't remember what they used uh, but here it is long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Okay, so here, some people will argue after God sent the son, he doesn't speak through prophets anymore because here it says God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in the last days he's spoken to us by his son. Well, there's a bit of a logical issue here that they're just making, this is an assumption. And I would say it is eisegesis that contradicts other scripture because it doesn't say here that God does not speak through the prophets because he speaks through his son. Now, even just in terms of having the scriptures, um, you know, God speaks through the scriptures. He still speaks through the prophets of the Old Testament that were given before Jesus and they testified to Jesus. So that's still going on, okay? Those historical writings. But even in the church, God still 
communicated through prophets to the church after sending the Son. And you can look in Matthew 23, where the Lord Jesus, before he was crucified, he said, Behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill and, pers- uh, and crucify and persecute them from city to city. And so then there's an also reference to God, uh, to Jesus, a similar quote from Jesus in a similar context in the book of Luke also. So you can look up that, that as well. So Jesus indicates that he would send prophets, okay? And so then you look in Acts, and in Acts, Jesus has already risen from the dead. It's like this continuation of the book of Luke. The Lord Jesus has already arisen from the dead, and he ascends into heaven. After ascending into heaven, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost and uh, after the outpouring of the Spirit, and there's a cloven tongues of fire and people speaking in tongues and languages that people could understand there in Acts 2. And those present said that, uh, or, or then Peter says that this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and he says, your young men shall have visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Okay, and that the spirit that the Lord would pour out His spirit, and they would uh, prophesy. Even the handmaidens would prophesy. So He's saying that this time of prophesying and dreams and visions that this is being fulfilled now. After God spoke through the Son, through Jesus being here in His earthly ministry, and now there's a continuation of the ministry through the Holy Spirit right now, and this is during the age when God speaks through the Spirit and gives gifts of the Spirit. We're in that age right now. We're still in the last days. The Lord Jesus has not returned yet. So the actual teaching of the Scriptures that does this that interpretation of Hebrews 1 doesn't make sense. And I think some people are a bit confused, and they seem to get their history mixed up. Maybe and seem to think that Hebrews 1 is a comment on a little line in the Westminster Confession that it's like expounding upon it rather than the Westminster Confession borrowing some language here and trying to stretch a little bit uh, that we don't consider that confession inspired like the actual scriptures. So if we look in the book of Acts, and if you continue reading, there were some prophets that went from the church in Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus, named Agabus stood up and signified by the Spirit about a, drought, uh, a famine, let's say a famine that was coming. And then um, in Acts 15, there's this uh, apostles and elders meet in Jerusalem, and then they send Judas and Silas, who were prophets, um, one of their number who were prophets to Gentile churches to carry some letters. So Silas later becomes Paul's co-worker. Now, um, so let me, um, so let's, let's uh, look a, a, a bit at some other scripture. Now, they did not quote this scripture here, but I believe I, they have in the past. And there's kind of this, um, I think, a dyslexic interpretation, if I could say that, no offense meant to people with dyslexia, but it's like an interpretation that confuses the words around in the mind. Let's take a look around, uh, that, that um, try to use this passage to say that God only speaks through scripture. It doesn't say that, and I think a lot of people who don't believe that, who hear people arguing that, like, huh, what are you trying to say with this verse? That doesn't make sense. That's the way I was. How are you trying to get that from this verse until you try to get in their mindset? And it doesn't make sense in the historical context of the Bible, and I'll explain why. But 2 Timothy 3, but you must continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And here it is. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay. Now this passage teaches that scripture is given, dot, 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 that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What it does not say is that scripture is all that is given, that the man of God might be fully equipped for every good work. That's a different concept. It's, it's talking about all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That's one thing. Another thing to say scripture is all that's given by the inspiration of God that's profitable for, for doctrine or correction or instruction in righteousness or proof. If, if scripture is all that we're given for that, then why would the Lord gift members of the body of Christ to expound on the word of God? Why would there be um, you know, ministers in the body? Why would he uh, raise up an evangelist or pastor or teacher um, or rather a pastor or teacher for, for equipping the man of God, so, or other ministry roles. So um, that it doesn't say that that's all that man, the man of God is given to be thoroughly equipped. Now, let me give you an example. If you, you could give a U.S. soldier, let's say a U.S. soldier has been trained, he's been given a uniform, he's been given his helmet, and then they issue him his rifle so that he might be fully equipped. 
that doesn't mean the rifle is all the man needs to be thoroughly equipped. You know, they also gave him a belt or something with the bullets in it, and that's part of the equipment. Without the bullets, he wouldn't be fully equipped, but he's given the rifle that he might be fully equipped. So it's just kind of a concept um, of logic. You know, uh, we have to use some logic and reason and not isogete ideas that aren't there. Also, uh, the idea that you don't need the stuff in the Bible that the Bible teaches that God gives us because we have the Bible is pretty messed up thinking. I mean, if you were to say the Bible teaches that the spirit gives gifts to members of the body of Christ as he wills. So it's like first Corinthians chapter 12. Well, you could say, oh, oh, because we have the Bible, the we don't this stuff that the Bible says that we get. We don't get that because we have the Bible. What do you apply that to other things? Oh, God gives us grace to be able to walk in his ways and follow him. But now we have the Bible. So would we say there's no more grace? Um, the Holy, the, the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us, which say, oh, God, we don't do that anymore. God doesn't pour out any love anymore. We, we have the Bible now. We don't need love. Uh, we just have the Bible. See, the Bible tells us about love and tells us we need love. But since, since we have the Bible, we don't need love. So you now when I start talking about things like that, then it, it gets ridiculous. You say, oh, you don't need to abstain from fornication anymore because we have the Bible and the Bible says to abstain from fornication. But since you have the Bible, you don't need to do that. Well, I mean, we can stretch it out and make it a little more and more ridiculous. But the same sort of ridiculous logic is applied to spiritual gifts or dreams and other things. Now, does the Bible teach that God speaks through dreams? Um, if you're trying to use Hebrew one, Hebrews 1 to say that God no longer speaks through dreams or visions of the night. Now, the problem, yeah, a problem you face with that is you get to Acts 2 and Peter applies an Old Testament scripture from Joel to the outpouring of spirit, the spirit in his time, talks about the outpouring of prophecy, uh, he talks about um, dreams and visions. So there's an, there's a, um, you know, this is a time for dreams and visions, this, the last days here for the outpouring of the spirit. Um, and it's, he extends it not only to the people of Israel, but to as many who are as afar off, which is what Paul calls Gentiles. So as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this uh, outpouring of the Spirit is not just for Jewish people, it's even for Gentiles. And it, he, the passage, you can read it in Acts 2, it includes prophesying, the outpouring of the Spirit, prophesying dreams and visions. So that's okay. And Paul had a vision of the night after Jesus came, after Jesus rose from the dead, after the outpouring of the Spirit on the days of, day of Pentecost, however many years or maybe decades or whatever it was into it, <clears throat> after Christ came on the earth, then Paul has a vision of the night that tells him to go to Macedonia. Now, Paul, actually, his conversion involved a supernatural meeting with Jesus. He might have heard the gospel before. Uh, maybe he heard the gospel after from Ananias, it doesn't even say where Paul heard the gospel. Now, are you, you reading the New Testament and you have to be so strict that it has to be some preacher besides Jesus for someone to believe in Jesus? I suspect Paul probably picked up the gospel from persecuting Christians beforehand. I mean, that's my opinion. But if not, he probably heard it through Ananias. But he had a revelation of Jesus, and it's possible Jesus said more than exactly what's in that quote there, and he, he understood. Um, he would have known he probably would have known that there were claims that Jesus rose from the dead. He would have known that Jesus was crucified. And, you know, maybe, maybe he's given insight. He understood the Old Testament. Boom, you know, he understood the gospel. However it happened, he had a supernatural experience that was instrumental in leading him to Jesus. In his case, it wasn't a dream while he was sleeping. It was this supernatural appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, let's consider, uh, also there was... Um, one of, one of the brothers, I believe is Osman uh, there, had said that there's scripture that leads him to uh, be skeptical, I uh, forget the exact wording, but to be skeptical of visions. Now, there is a warning in Colossians about visions, and in the context, uh, you know, it's about people who are vainly puffed up and things like that. There may be promoters of false doctrine who claim to have visions. But in general, should we be hyper-skeptical of visions and just kind of consider them to be worthless? I don't see that as the overall tenor of the New Testament regarding the topic, because you, re you read in Acts 2 that in the last days, there's going to be this outpouring of the Spirit, your, your um, young men shall have visions. So then you, you read on and you actually see there's an appearance of an angel to Cornelius, who is a Gentile who fears God, and he sees a revelation of an angel telling him to call for Peter. Now, Peter's going to preach to him the gospel. The angel doesn't tell him the gospel. So, you know, there's the human instrument here of the preacher of the gospel. But 
in, involved in Peter's in, in Cornelius conversion was a, a this led the way this is part of the steps that opened up Cornelius to hear the gospel and then Peter has a vision he has a vision of unclean animals being in a sheet and he's told right to kill and eat and he said he's never eaten anything unclean or or common and he hears in the vision what God has cleansed do not call thou common and based on that he had a probably it would have had an issue with his conscience to go under a Gentile's roof. Now, there were 18 edicts from the Sanhedrin about Gentiles under the Shammai leadership that are lost to history, but had something to do with Gentiles. And, you know, Jesus had told the, uh, he had said, whatsoever the scribes and Pharisees to bid you observe, that observe, observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. So there's this kind of, you know, they're wanting to submit to the government. They're wanting to submit to the leadership of Israel. If there's a conflict, they say, we must obey God rather than men. But if not, they're going to submit to the leadership in Israel. And then maybe there's some Jewish law from the Sanhedrin or interpretation of the law that tells them not to go hang out with the Gentiles. And so Peter, you know, may, maybe because of that, he was hesitant. This is a bit of my uh, historical speculation based on the context. But for whatever reason, it's not in the Old Testament, but Peter says it was, uh, he, he was concerned about it being, whether it was lawful for him to go there and be under the roof. But he goes in and uh, after this vision, he has a vision that leads him there. And then he shares the gospel with the Gentiles. And so through Peter's vision, uh, people came to Christ. So the idea of people coming to Christ through visions, which should be a little bit more spectacular than dreams maybe, or a little more uh, concerning possibly than, than having a dream, because it's, well, that's pretty cool to have a vision, or that's pretty pretty revelatory to have a vision. Um, if, if that can happen, then why can't God speak through dreams? Now let's look, I'd had that scripture on there. I didn't realize I had my screen on there the whole time, and I'm going to go back. But um, here, if you read from this scripture, you can like pause it if you want to, or I'll read it out loud. This is Job 33, and this is that, uh, was it Eli, what is it, uh, Elihu, I think? Anyway, this is the young man who goes to Job. Uh, Job has three comforters, and these three guys are older than this third, fourth young guy who comes along, but they're getting it wrong. And this guy says some things, but uh, in the end, when the Lord speaks, a lot of what he says kind of aligns with what the Lord speaks. And so this is one of Job's friends, one of Job's friends says, why do you contend with him? For he does not give accounting of his words. For God may speak in one way or another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, when slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So this is from the New King James Version. So here in verse 15, in a dream and a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. So this is about God opening up people's ears while they're asleep. So they're getting this revelation in a dream from God. And we have in the Old Testament, it's not just the Jewish prophets. There's Pharaoh, he has a dream. God speaks to him through a dream. Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream and it's a revelatory dream. Also, there's some guy in, among the Midianites when in the time of Gideon, Gideon uh, goes down to the Midianite camp and he hears one of them tell about a dream about a barley loaf rolling down the hill and smiting the camp, knocking, or smiting a tent and knocking it over. And the other one says, this can be none other, but the, but Gideon, I think it was the son of Joash or what, anyway, whatever his dad's name, son of uh, so-and-so. And so this is, um, even a Gentile could have a dream. So the question is, where does the Bible teach that God repealed his desire or his decree here or his teaching of scripture that God speaks through dreams. I cannot find it in the Bible. Now, again, it, we're talking about 2 Timothy 3 earlier, the idea that God, uh, that only the Bible makes a man thoroughly equipped. It doesn't say that. But if you're going to try to use this scripture to say that God does not speak through any revelatory means, that he doesn't give any prophecies that are in line with scripture or any dreams or whatever, then think about what that really implies. There is a second Timothy chapter 4. And if scripture is in, inspired because it's prophetically inspired, then wouldn't you have to reject 2 Timothy chapter 4 and to kick it out of the canon and say it's not scripture because boom, it ended right here at verse 16. And if the book of Revelation was written after 2 Timothy, wouldn't you have to say, well, we can't accept that either. And then in the book of Revelation, it says that there are going to be two uh, witnesses that prophesy. 
And you would think that that would have to come after the last amen in the book of Revelation after the epistle was sent, when the readers actually read it, it would happen sometime after that, no matter how you interpret what the two witnesses are, but they were going to prophesy. You could redefine prophesying and make it out to be something else, but you know, uh, people could do all kinds of things and try to argue all kinds of things, but it just doesn't make sense based on the scripture to say that God doesn't speak through dreams or whatever. The Bible just doesn't say that. It just shows God speaking through dreams, says he speaks through dreams and gives us some examples. Now it does warn that there were false prophets who got dreams out of their own hearts. Okay, so not every dream is a revelatory dream from God. And another problem I see with this is Calvinism. I think these two gentlemen are Calvinists. Um, now, if someone is really heavily into Calvinism and they're totally into the ter determinism, think about it. What does a, where does a dream come from? Well, some Calvinists would even say that God is responsible, he's behind evil, that he makes everything happen, everything in the universe and uh, is just predestined, it's all God's will and it's all gonna happen. So let's say that you lay down and you have a dream and I believe it was Justin Peters or maybe one of the two brothers there that said that somebody could have a uh, that God could use a dream to help lead someone to the Lord, which is what I think maybe like charismatics would think or Pentecostals might think, you know, <laughs> or evangelicals that accept the idea that God speaks through dreams. So <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, that God could use a dream to lead people to the Lord. But then you want to say the dream is not from the Lord or the dream is not revelatory from the Lord. Well, if you believe that God makes every little thing happen, including the person go down to sleep and makes all the stuff go on in their brain that causes them to have the dream, and the dream is for the intensive purpose of leaving the person to the Lord. How is that different from the idea of God giving somebody a dream as a type of revelation? Okay, so that's, that's the problem. I mean, does that even make sense to object to it? So it's like, there's this, it seems to me like this straw man uh, throughout the video that it's either God's or the false dichotomy too, like God either speaks to dreams or he speaks to the gospel. Well, I mean, people have to hear the gospel. They have to believe the gospel to be saved. Now, does a human always have to share the gospel? There's a passage in the book of Revelation where the John has a vision of an angel pro proclaiming the gospel. So, um, you know, I mean, can we really rule out the idea that the Bible teaches that an angel might be able to share the gospel, to preach the gospel, and someone might be able to hear it from an angel? If, what about Paul's seeing the Lord Jesus um, in, in a revelatory experience? And if you want to say, oh, nobody ever saw Jesus after Paul, because Paul said, last of all, he appeared to me as one born out of due time. Uh, due, due time there, that's like a, the word means like a premature infant, not, not an infant born too late, but an infant that's born too early, actually, but it's like a baby that's not going to survive because uh, he's so small. So, yeah, so as, um, but John saw a vision of Christ after Jesus appeared to um john saw a vision of christ after the lord jesus appeared to paul so you know paul you have to kind of take that in the context is he saying jesus is never going to appear to anybody ever again well apparently not because jesus appeared to john after that so in the book of revelation so uh, another uh concern is uh there was an odd comment in there that why is jesus only appearing to the muslims and not other other people well in dreams or why only these people having dreams about Jesus. And I don't know that. I mean, how do you know that? If you ask Harry Krishnas, have you done surveys on Harry Krishnas to ask them if they've had visions of Jesus? Have you uh, surveyed Hindus to see if they've had visions of Jesus? But I, I will tell you some Arabs, not all, but some, I mean, some Muslims, not all, maybe Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites. And you know, Abraham prayed for them. And Abraham said, or he prayed at least for Ishmael. He said, oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And in the, I think it's the NIV, it says, no, you know, God's answer starts with no, but there's no, no in the Hebrew there. You know, he, it says that God has heard his prayer. Okay, so what does it mean to live before God? The just shall live by faith. And if I'm going to pray for Ishmaelites, I'm going to re remind God, hey, you know, Abraham prayed, I might just say, hey, but you know, Abraham prayed this and you said, uh, you, you said that you'd heard his prayer and he was praying that Ishmael may live before you, Lord. And if these people are part of Ishmael, let them live before you and let them believe in Jesus. That would be my prayer of intercession for the, for the Ishmaelite people. Now, a lot of Muslims aren't. Most Muslims probably aren't, at least not patrilinear uh, uh, linear descendants of Ishmael. But also the comment that if millions of people were coming to Christ, we'd expect Indonesia and Turkey or, where, or maybe Iran to look a little different. Okay. Uh, um, a billion is a thousand times a million. Okay, so <laughs> that's 
you know, if one out of a thousand or two out of a thousand people have a dream, are you going to, are their countries all going to be transformed? I mean, there's like nearly, uh, there's around a billion Muslims in the world. Okay. So if millions of them are coming to Christ, you know, it's an order of magnitude issue. Okay. So another thing is I've spent 12 years in Indonesia. So let me talk a little bit about it. Um, in, in Indonesia, it's a majority Muslim country, but I have heard Christians say that some, some just Christians think, you know, I think we're probably about 20 or 25% Christian here. I think maybe we got about 25%. There's just a lot going on here. And uh, the, I think the, uh, the government might keep it around 89% for the official statistics for, you know, they don't want people to get upset. So there's that, that could be happening. I've heard estimates that this huge house church movement that's growing in Iran, maybe there's 25 or 30% Christian, I don't know. And sometimes I think people, they're wishful thinking and just people are excited, you know, and they'll, they'll say stuff like that. How can you know, unless you get some statistics or whatever, and then maybe you get some evidence and even then, you know, that could be subject to some biases and, and, and just human error. And it's all based on the assumption that statistics is accurate so that it works every time. Um, and that God is cooperating with your statistics and your surveys <laughs> a little bit. Uh, a lot of people, if it's underground, they're probably not going to go around filling out surveys and telling people that they're Christian if they're afraid of persecution sometimes. And one of the concerns, and this is 20 years ago in Indonesia when they were saying that I don't think it's nine, you know, I don't think we're just 9% of the population or 8% or whatever they say we are. Um, but back then, the people I was talking with, they said they went to the head, the village head or the ERTE, whatever that stands for and then RT, and they get their uh, their KTP ID, the national ID, and it has their religion on it over there. They got five legal religions. They put the religion on their ID, um, and on the ID, it says Muslim, and they filled out the form Christian, and then they get the ID, this ID that says Muslim. For, for a lot of people, it doesn't matter. If you want to get married, it's an issue because you can't marry somebody of a different religion there, so that's where it would be a legal issue, but um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another issue. So, uh, you know, if you haven't seen these transformations, another question is, how much time have you spent in Iran and Indonesia? You know, I say I spent 12 years, haven't been there in about six, but, you know, I uh, also talked with a brother, he's actually a Baptist, and uh, he had planted churches in a Middle East, well, not Middle East, um, in a predominantly Islamic country, and uh, they had 20,000 house churches, and my understanding is that they were Muslim background believers. Um, 20,000 house churches, and they, some of them could be small, so they could be as little as five, they could be bigger than that, so we're talking really large, and he only knew eight generations, and there were more, but he couldn't count them, so he didn't, he said 20,000. So these are, there are, there, and that was among Muslim background believers, and that's one little ministry uh, that grew into that, these churches replicated based on the Great Commission, so, or they focus on the Great Commission, and, and each church fulfilling that as the churches grew and multiplied, so um, now, um, one thing that really concerned me is asserting that this may be a tactic of Satan. I mean, if some Muslims are coming to Jesus through dreams, does that mean that the individual Christian is saying, I'm not going to share my faith because a Muslim might, uh, with a Muslim because a Muslim might come to Christ through a dream? Well, first of all, I don't know of anybody. I mean, I guess there's people with fuzzy ideas about doctrine and salvation, and that's a big problem right now. Or we've got this really truncated gospel that leaves the cross in the resurrection and just repeat a prayer that mentions Jesus and we who we didn't tell you anything about that sort of thing certainly in the US I've seen it exported abroad so there is this kind of fuzziness and evangelicalism about it so you know that could be an issue but um I someone could say I'm not going to share the gospel because oh there's an evangelist in town does that mean there shouldn't be an evangelist in town or that God doesn't use evangelists as part of the process um so anyway uh Jesus was accused of casting out demons by Beelzebub, by an unclean spirit. And then he warned about speaking evil of the Holy Spirit or speaking ill of the Holy Spirit, blaspheming the Holy Spirit as being the unforgivable sin. So I would be very careful. Certainly, if you're going to label all the dreams that people have as being from Satan and some of them are from the Holy Spirit, maybe, and, you know, you didn't know that. But you, you got to be careful. I, mean, I don't think the, the, the Pharisees were thinking, we know this man's from God, but we're going to reject him. They had hardened hearts. They didn't believe. Um, so they, uh, Jesus warned them like that. So this is, that's an area where you want to really be careful when you're dealing with 
a supernatural type phenomenon that according to the Bible is something that God does. And there's nothing in the Bible that says that God doesn't do that anymore. And then you want to attribute all that to Satan. And I'm not saying that they went that, that, uh, that uh, Peterson went that far. I am concerned. And it makes me think, oh, this is somebody who's, I, this makes me want to put him in a category with some of the critic people that he criticizes sometimes as somebody that I'm not really going to recommend as a teacher for people to listen to. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, either of these gentlemen because I mean, they're not even make, their interpretation of scripture, how they're arguing, doesn't even make sense. And they're arguing against biblical phenomenon based on some really bizarre, uh, just nonsensical arguments using scriptures that don't back up their claims if you really think about it. Um, yeah, if God only spoke through his son and stopped speaking through the prophets uh, when Jesus came, well, then you'd have to start reject part of Jesus' teaching in the gospel. You'd have to reject Acts. You'd have to reject 1 Corinthians. Um, that's that's not what the passage means. So and and it just really doesn't make sense. You just sit down and think about what the interpretations mean. That would be my encouragement. Study the scriptures and really think about what they mean um, and pray for the Holy Spirit to give insight. God bless you and thank you for watching this video.